So as ever, we're recording the intro after we've done all the rest of the program, which confuses me greatly. But it's 4020 Not Live, the final one of this run where uh, we are um, remote because as of Monday, we'll be back uh, in our normal place. Um, how we will be in our normal place, I don't know, because we're going to have to work out where we can all sit and stuff and how we will sabu- work. Bring on the Sabutio. It'll be back. We, you can be a Sabutio rugby pitcher part. Um and, and that should be all right uh, because everything's getting back to normal. Fans are back in grounds. We'll hear from Andrew Quirk in a few moments. He was at the ground yesterday uh, to see Saints beat Salford. Uh, and then we'll be heading to Australia where George Clark, 4020 Magazine contributor and Fox Sports journalist, Fox Sports. They're like Sky, but with a Fox on their name instead of Sky. I wonder why, you know, why did Murdoch never brand it as Fox here? I don't know. I don't know. But um, he'll be here as well. So, so he's, good, we can talk he's about, a good lad. He's a good lad. He is. We can talk about the NRL and, and Samoa, which is the an interesting topic, a very interesting topic ahead of the World Cup, which, fingers crossed, will be going ahead. But at least we can buy World Cup golf balls and hats. So, so we've got to praise the World Cup people. They know, they, they're getting all these partners on board, which is good. I filled yeah. in my accreditation form. Um, I think every, games, every game, you took, put, even games that were taking place at the same time, <laughs> I've, I've got a bit of all of them. I only think the women's ones, but not the ones I can't go to. Because um, I just, I don't know, I can go back and change if I, if I feel like it. Of course. But, you know. Be, be there. A bit, I think indeed. Yeah. I, know, I know that there are clearly some concerns about, it's mainly player concerns that, you know, what restrictions will they have to face when they go back to their their uh, homelands and, and will they have to go into quarantine and all that kind of thing. We, we've sort of seen it with the IPL cricketers. Yeah. And, but I think, the, you know, the fact that by then most of the population in this country will have been vaccinated um, is, is, is going to change, hopefully, for the better. But yes, <laughs> uh, crowds are back. That is the topic. Uh, not even so much the results, which were oddly bizarre in that all those ho- home teams that had crowds, Bar St Helens managed to lose. Um, but just what it means, and I think it is hard to put into words. I know we're going to try with Andrew, and I was fortunate enough to be at, at Castleford last night, and yeah, there were there were tears brought to eyes, genuinely, because everything, the, the essence of sport, if you like, comes home to you when fans are in the ground, when you've had effectively, you know, 14 months without them, and, let, you know, don't want to get overly romanticised about it and try and compare it too much to the direction other sports are going in that seems to have forgotten their fans, but being in that ground at, at, at Castleford last night, where it clearly means so much to, to that community of people, irrespective of the fact that by the end they were booing the referee, um, it was just magic. I think seen... Uh... I think I think it's Hearts in Scotland who are giving the season ticket holders a season ticket for next year or whatever. Which you know they've paid for it. You know, fair enough. Blah blah blah. Sheffield United have been relegated and been crap all year. Forty quid to go see their meaningless game against Burnley at the weekend. I, I, and with the amount of money in Premier League football, you're thinking, you know, and 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 clubs are charging more than that as well. Further up the the table, it's like just let them in free. It's the Didn't last sound- game. Who was it on this program who said we could? Uh, oh no, it, it was another podcast I was doing with uh, Alan Biggs, the uh, the, the football uh, broadcaster, who said there's an argument now for saying you should let fans in for free because they're part of the entertainment, they're part they're part of the broadcast experience for the viewer at home. It's like a TV audience; they make the atmosphere. They're, they're more than that, though, because what we've learned over the last fourteen months is that whilst you can never fault the players for their effort. They are performing in an artificial arena without the fans. And it's about meaning more than anything else. What does sport mean? You know, the amount of money that comes in from television has almost marginalised the fan to, 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 to being irrelevant. But without that fan, there is no meaning to the money that's coming from other sources. And, um, you know, he, he, it would have been lovely for the Castleford fans if they could have heard Sweet Caroline at the end of that game. The fact that they couldn't was because... <laughs> To be fair, Hull KL were better and they were brilliant. And we can talk about, um, you know, the things that Tony Smith's doing in an era where it, it, the, the rules encourage five drives and a kick. His team, are, when they get it right, play the best rugby that you can see out there. And and they did on uh, last night and, and deserved to win. But, yeah, 
you have to have fans. Fans are more important than the money that they put into the game. Without without fans, there is no real meaning to sport. It's like the darts. When you see um, the darts away from the fans, the pro tour, when Peter Wright is not wearing his hair up and got paint on his face. Not to, and people say, what's this got to do with Billy? He's the Rhinos fan, isn't he? Because of course he's Rhinos. And he's just normal Peter Wright. But when he's on the telly and he's all spiky hair, and it's a bit like this. He's like he's, he's Peter. He's snake bite. He's, he's different person. It's different different thing. It, it, it's it came across on TV last night. You you could hear in in, in Bill's voice that it it was it was different. It was it was Every, different as it's been for the last 13, 14 months. Everybody feeds off the crowd. You know the, the commentators do, the referee does, the players do. Uh, that when there are more uh, away fans in the ground, that that sort of you know almost wave of noise and sound that goes between the, the ends. That, that That's what makes it worthwhile. I, I'm not a follower of football and, you know, bought into a little bit the romanticism of Leicester City winning the FA Cup. Um, but what came across watching the odd clip of it was that it meant so much more because the fans were in there. Uh, yeah. Know, not that, you know, what we've done in the interim with Challenge Cup finals and Grand Finals, it's just been amazing. Absolutely amazing. I've I've got you know every sympathy for the administrators that have got us to the point that we have in trying to operate in the most impossible of circumstances. I've got the most incredible admiration, probably more than I've ever had for the players, because what we've been able to to do in the interim is, is hear them, uh, and not just to hear what what they go through while they're playing the game, but you know that flesh upon bone smash that goes on in every tackle <laughs> you, you're in awe of these people you don't know how they do it but the one thing that's been missing is why they do it and what feeds them to do it and it is the fans uh because we have recorded this after the rest of the podcast there is some news oh, that what? has happened uh which means we can uh say that last night's uh, big rugby league controversy on social media is now uh, well chip paper because anthony galling has been found not guilty of uh, the charge he was brought before the courts of so he's now uh, able to resume his uh, career without that uh, hanging over his head so all that controversy last night is done and dusted with whether there should be some kind of uh morality thing which we said before um i don't know the, the sport has a strange Ben Barber was banned from playing in Super League under the exact same, well, not under under I similar it, circumstances, but but it's but not it's similar. To, well, it's safe to say if we had the kind of integrity unit that they do in Australia, and like we've seen with the Jack de Bellin case, who may well be proved innocent at the end of it, we don't know. Um, he wouldn't be playing at the moment until that case was finished. Um, same with Jared Hay. Uh, so the, there is an inconsistency there that I think does need to be looked at. And, uh, well, it just seemed odd that somebody could walk out of an ongoing court case and play. Uh, whether they're innocent or guilty is not the same as whilst that is proven, should they be allowed to play their trade? I suspect oh, yeah. we need greater standards in place. It, it's, it's not that it hasn't, hasn't happened in other sports before. Um, you know, we <laughs> seems a long time ago now the trial of those Leeds United footballers who played throughout their trial and what that did to the club and whatever. But we we, we can't have one rule for one person and, and go out and make a big song and dance about banning them and then not other players in the same situation. And we've said that before on this programme and it just makes the sport look stupid and inconsistent and that's all you want is consistency we talk about it with referees and and referees have a hard time being consistent because they're having to make split second decisions the administrators who run the sport have plenty of time to make decisions over what you know you can make black and white rules about things about what you decide is allowed and what isn't allowed and i don't know why we we, we as we say the sport shoots itself in the foot when it doesn't need to and as it turns out in this case, it would have been, should you ban players when they are involved in an ongoing case? Well, there's an argument to say yes or no, but if you're going to ban one, then you ban them all. I don't think it's about banning. I just think it's standing down. Or standing down, right? That's the better what, use of language. Yeah. Judicial process takes. I, I think the other thing that um, clearly events have moved on and we shouldn't spend too much time talking about it, but 
I do think as well that there has to be an element of realism sometimes. And t- whether he scored 10 tries last night, naming him as your man of the match is, again, in terms of what that, that opens up for the sport and, and the scrutiny it puts on this, probably wasn't the cleverest thing to do. It's, it's just smart, isn't it? It's just, just be smart. Be smart. Be smarter. Especially with things that you can control. You know, you can control what your chairman writes in his column. I mean, granted, when uh, <laughs> when we used to work at a radio station where the owner had his own audio column, you know, one of the uh, because there there would be many stories to tell about that place. There was a um, proposal to said owner of said radio station that he should buy a rugby league club which you could probably add two and two together to work out which one, and we would run it and make a documentary about it. That would be great. And it would have been better than as it turned out, but you can well, work out there, which one that would have been. There's a missed opportunity. It would have been, uh, it would have been interesting. Um, apropos of, of uh, not mentioning what club that was, um, Stuart Duffy's retiring. Somebody I'd love to pay tribute to if we've got a couple of minutes. Of course. Because, um, a mentor to so many. Uh, more than anything, I don't think I've ever cro- come across anyone in the game, uh, particularly in the administrative side of things, that is as passionate about it and has done so much behind the scenes for the clubs he's worked at and so many people within those clubs, the, the, the young people that have come along that he's given an opportunity to, uh, the great company that he is, uh, you know, the tales that he, you, you, you need to come across raconteurs in your life because we can all get to hear stories, but very few of us can tell them in such a way that they, you know, uh, they entertain you. And and he is absolutely the, the top end of that. He he tells the most magnificent stories. He's got a wonderful memory, um, kind, considerate, understands the very essence of rugby league and and has made a massive contribution um he's going to be sadly missed uh, but i think he's going to stay involved even if it's as a fan or um I, you know, class him as a, as a very very close and good friend and uh, he's done absolutely wonderful things for the sport now as uh, people will realize got the uh, the builders in here at 4020 underground bunker um, so they, they, they're coming around in a minute to strip the wallpaper off. So before we get to the rest of the programme, is there anything else we need to mention? No, it's uh, just hopefully we, you know, we'll be back in a, 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 a more usual environment next week and, and hopefully more and more fans can be, to be back where they want to be. And uh, when you get there, um, just make the most of it because you, you do not know what you've missed until it's gone and then you really do have to savour it when it comes back. COVID secure biscuits. Uh, in the studio next week um, Monday from 6 although might be a bit earlier than 6 for um, for obvious reasons don't fall for cheap imitations uh, right guests George Clark coming up first top autobiographer well he's well, not an autobiographer biographer ghost, ghost writer. writer ghost writer he gets his name in the little letters after the person's name. They're in the big letters. And this is with, with Andrew Quirk. Okay. So the, as, as, as the, the viewers can see, um, in the, the Bijou studio, which obviously is, is finishing now because obviously lockdown's over. The country has come back to normal. We'll be back in the, the normal place next week. It's been renovated. Uh, for some reason, there's a... Reindeer here. Don't, don't know what that's doing here. And some books about mining. I guess I'm in the north. It has to be that way. Um, it's the last in the current series of 4020 Not Live until, of course, what? How, how long are we giving it? Two, three weeks? <laughs> <laughs> that, you've just reminded me I need to get the Hoover out. Oh, nice. Uh, covered in dust. Uh, much like uh, the seats of Stadia across the country. But uh, now they are filled with people. And, and, and those people include author. Potter of words into people's mouths. Andrew Quirk, who was there yesterday at the Totally Wicked Stadium. You were there. What, what what was it like? What was it like to be back in the ground after forever? As Daft Punk once sang, if love is the answer, you're home. 
and it was it was quite emotional really because they played Annie's song shortly before kickoff, which I know we probably stole from. You stole from Sheffield, Sheffield United. Sheffield United, yeah, United. yes. I, thought, blade, I knew yeah. you were going to say that, but and everyone was singing, and then there was, there was the big chorus of "All oh, When the Saints," and to be back on the ground as the players came out, you could see what it meant to them after playing in front of you know uh, empty grounds. It was it, it was fantastic. It was everything I thought it would be. I've really missed it, and you had. The ability to watch live sport, the ability of feeling some normality is coming back into your life and um, and, and catching up with people you, you hadn't seen for, for a long time. So it seems to have been it seems to have gone really well from from a perspective at Saints last night. Uh, it was very well organised. Um, they had the, 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 the dispensers on entry into the stadium and then they were handing out the um, antigen tests on your way out as well. So you could test yourself after the game. So hopefully. Um, it's step one into getting more and more people back and uh, and everyone getting back into the stadiums. Uh, did, did everyone generally behave? I mean, watching the get, Warrington game on TV, people still d- don't wear their masks over their noses. I mean, I mean, we are, you know, every year into this thing. Mate, it's yeah. the bane of my life that, you know, <laughs> if you're going to wear it around your chin, what is the point? And and I did see a couple of people whose, whose mask uh, discipline wasn't what it should have been, but there was plenty of stewards on hand, and actually, Saints were really good about announcing her over the tannoy to remind people, um, you know, you must wear your mask inside the stadium. And I think, by and large, most people they did they did comply, which is which is really good. Well, we're not the mass police, by the way. We know people have legitimate <laughs> reasons not to wear masks, but I, I do like the people who have those lanyards which uh, indicate that they, they they are able not to wear masks, but still wear a mask as well because you know they they want to help everybody else as opposed to those virulent anti-maskers who are just anti-social morons uh but that's di- that's different from people you know, who, who uh, people who would you know don't have you know legitimate reason not to wear masks that's all right is that the politics done yeah i think that's the politics <laughs> done. uh on the field saints saints about i mean uh, the great thing is andrew you're my second favorite saints fan because i, I love kev on social media who's, who's the most <laughs> negative person uh, to, to to follow the back-to-back champions um you know, unbeaten, win everything, blah, 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 win to nil yesterday. But he's not happy, is he? He's never happy with the style of play. But you, you nil you nil sold for the, the grand finals a couple of years ago. Kev was stood very close to me last night at the game and 20 minutes after the 15 months break and, you know, he was really looking forward to getting back, I heard, God, they're terrible, aren't they? They just can't <laughs> attack. What a brilliant, boring team brilliant. to watch. It's like Cunningham's back. So he wasn't, he wasn't best pleased with the attack, but I think... Did he, going to go on about the defence. The defence, I think, is is really, really good. And what I've said all along is when our attack does click, and I think it will at some point in the season, I think we'll be absolutely fine. And, and I, I don't think there's much of a panic at Saints. I don't think it's Saints in crisis when you're top of the league in the semi-final of the Cup and you didn't concede a point. So, But Saints fans very demanding and it's this history of, of being entertained, um, which is, I think, that little bit of tension against the current style of play. But I think we'll be OK. A millstone around any team's neck, Phil, isn't it? When when you when you dub the entertainers and you don't entertain anymore, it's like it's like Wigan under uh, Sean Wayne, where everyone's like, "Oh, they're boring," <laughs> and they only have Plan A, and uh, but they keep winning things, and then they don't win things, and they, you know, it's it's not quite the same, is it? But uh, you reap what you sow, I guess. Well, I have to say I was fortunate enough to be at Castleford last night and echoing everything that Andrew said. I mean, clearly he was at a game where he had a dog in the fight. Um, I I was just there to be part of welcoming crowds back and gauging some reaction to it. And I think the only word you can use is emotional. I think if you love sport, uh, its true essence is in having crowds back and you you realise what you've missed and how much you've missed it. And that was really when the Castleford side ran out to warm up and virtually everybody who was buying in in the ground either got up off their seats or shrieked their heads off if they were standing up behind the terraces just because they could see and and connect again with their heroes. And of course, you know, an hour into the game, they were screaming offside and uh, berating the ref because the opposition were actually playing better than them. But there's something absolutely magical about playing in front of fans that I don't think we ever didn't appreciate. But I think when you haven't had it for a while, um, it just mean it meant it meant everything. You know, when when the team does run out, and and it was a mutual acknowledgement thing, as I'm sure it was at St Helens as well. That the the players were clapping the fans as much as the fans were were welcoming the players. Um, 
the hair stand up on the back of your neck for for no other reason than this is what you've been watching sport for for all your life and this is what it means um uh, you know you talk about the music that was played highly appropriately i think um as the fans were allowed into the ground at Weldon Road, they played the Verve's Bittersweet Symphony. And and for a while, that's what it was, because there was the minute silence before the game for all of those who, you know, desperately can't be there and, and who we were, we were all thinking about. And, and clearly the world has changed. Everybody behaved. There were gaps between people in the stands. That there were respectful spaces between people on the terraces. There was um, a, a delay when the ground was emptied at the end because they did it section by section. And, and there was no um, compulsion by anybody to break what the rules were. And that was fantastic. And, yeah, we can talk about the games, but actually the story this week is is the fans. Whatever normal was, Andrew, it's not going to be like this for a while, is it? So we're going to have to get used to what it was yesterday. But And I guess it's just the fact that we are allowed back is the main thing and whatever we have to do to be back is 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 irrelevant. I think that's the key thing. I think because we've had such limited uh, ability to do many things that we took for granted just 18 months ago, that it, it is small steps. And I think people are so grateful. I mean, obviously, there was a lot of... Uh, Saints fans who would have wanted to have been at last night's game who weren't successful in the ballot um, so it, it it was a privilege to be there especially on that first night back and to experience that so yes obviously you know wearing the mask might be a little bit uncomfortable it gets hot um, I personally wasn't used to being stood up st- still for two hours I'm an old man now and my back was singing out but I'll, I, I won't complain about anything and I think whatever we need to do to, to continue this journey safely for everybody then, then people will will comply, I'm sure. And it's great credit to rugby league supporters, and and over the past twelve months, where Saints have won the, the 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 Super League, Leeds won the Challenge Cup, teams have won various different things and done various different things that fans haven't congregated outside stadia and celebrated and trashed city centres and whatever as we've seen in other sports over the past twelve months, not just this weekend, and you know. Fans have missed out on those great communal moments. I, mean, I know you had Tommy Makers and wandering around the, the ground with the trophy yesterday, but it, it's not the same as being in a packed old draft and being in the car park afterwards and celebrating. No, exactly. And and, and I think there's two points there. Obviously, we, we discussed um, it previously when I was on the podcast about the, the, the ending to the last grand final. And if that, that had been played in front of a packed stadium, the reactions of everybody, I think it would have been absolutely incredible. But the second thing about not congregating outside grounds, which is really important, is that Langtree Park is a, is a COVID vaccination hub, already vaccinated over 100,000 people. So it's really important that people stay away because it's it's being used for a, a very, very important uh, uh, role in the community as well. I was going to say, I think the other thing is we need to pay tribute to the players because what came home last night was whilst they could not have given more, and that is to their eternal credit because they clearly do thrive off an atmosphere. Um, there's been an artificiality, uh, and I echo everything Andrew says. You know, we've been privileged to be in grounds when there's been no crowd uh, to, to report on the action, and there's never been anything less than total commitment by any player who's played under these um, rogue circumstances. But the game was different last night because there was an interaction that we haven't had, um, and and it was lovely not to hear the players, that they were drowned out by the chanting of songs. But I I tell you what I miss more than anything, um, humour, because this has been such a dark and and, and tragic time for so many. Um, But you forget just how funny fans can be and and spontaneously funny. Um, And and just even as the, the sides lined up last night, uh, Hulk Hour were kicking off towards the Weldon Road end where, um, you know, the, the, those passionate Castleford fans who always start singing, get into them uh, immediately. They're, they're, they're on the defensive are. And um, I think uh, oh no, Cass were kicking off to that end and Ryan Hall was lining up in front of those fans. And they came up with an absolutely hilarious chant for him, which I won't repeat because um, it wasn't for... Uh, for, for, for a, uh, an audience that, that may well contain uh, people under the age of 18. But not only did he laugh 
but he stuck his thumbs up to the Castleford fans because they'd found something to try and put him off, but actually that was very, very funny. It, it revolved around you're just a fat leads reject. And and you'd suddenly realise that's what you've missed. And, and it, it, yeah, clearly by the end, uh, those who, who have got in have forgotten that 14 months of, uh, uh, you know, waiting for that opportunity doesn't mean that they can't vent their, their opinions on what they've seen. And absolutely they should. Um, and, and to be fair, Hulk KR were magnificent. But um, it's all the little things you take for granted, I think, are the ones that you notice the most when you go back. He's, uh, according to some on social media, he's played himself into the World Cup squad, Ryan Hall. He did play very, very well. Um, yeah, I, I have to say that uh, if you were looking for a certain style of winger um, and, and a couple of others who perhaps you might put above him uh, were not available, uh, you wouldn't hesitate to bring him back the way he's playing at the moment. I tell you, he's got a cracking trial last night. Uh, speaking of England internationals, Jermaine McGilvery for uh, Huddersfield, uh, who, who trusted the process. Um, get that on your T-shirts, Huddersfield Giants. There's the one for free um, against Warrington, who I don't know what Warrington are still. They're, they're like the um, the Cheshire equivalent of the Catalan Dragons, um, who also, we don't know what they are, apart from very good last night against Hull. And I haven't seen any of that game either, so I can't really comment on that other than that they, that they won convincingly by 27 points to 10. And you mentioned it last week, Phil, about Tom Davies being a potential England candidate. And again, he uh, apparently impressed last night for the Catalan Dragons. Uh, so uh, just some wonderfully inconsistent size, but Huddersfield at least now, as we've been saying for weeks, not to worry about them because they were going to come good eventually and showed patch of that and also patch of their not so good self last night on the telly at least i think if you can see improvement then you know they're moving in the right direction and clearly it was always going to take time because ian watson i mean we laugh about the phrase the process but he clearly is a guy who wants his team and the players that he selected in that team to play a certain way uh, and I think he's proved over the last couple of years that that is a way that you, you can guarantee success. So he's got half a team that knows that way and half a team who is trying to teach that way. There was always going to be some some time. Uh, but once once they, they get it right, then, you know, to go to Warrington on a Monday night and, and come away with the spoils, uh, that's no mean feat. And, and to play the way I believe they did in the first half, because clearly, again, I've only seen the, the try highlights, um, and then hold on shows both sides of their game as well. It, it, it is interesting, and people were quick to pick it up that we had um, what was it five games in Super League and two in the Championship. And certainly of the five games in Super League, the the four of the away teams won. Um, I'm not sure you can read anything into that other than they were the better teams on the night. Um, what what's been interesting as well, and it, it'd be it'd be good to get Andrew's take because he he sort of hinted at the way Saints are playing at the moment, and again watching from the outside, it, it seems to be that because the rules have changed at this season, um, Christian Wolf's emphasis is slightly different to what Justin Holbrook's was uh, in that. You know, Holbrook will all be forever labelled as the coach of the great entertainers, and, and Wolf has reined that in a bit and made them just maybe harder to to score against, which is partly to do with the rules that we're playing. And and I went into this round of matches wondering, perhaps if it was an age thing, that we weren't seeing great entertainment um, and that the loss of the scrum and that the introduction of the six again and the, the obviously contentious, uh, Richard would say, ball steel rule um, has meant that we it, it's now all about keeping hold of the ball and and almost harrying the opposition into mistakes, which is searching for an error rather than creating an opportunity. I have to say that one thing I really did enjoy about Hull KR's performance last night is that they didn't play like that. And we know that Tony Smith encourages his guys to go out there and use the ball. And even with the, the bringing back of relegation, he, you know, Jordan Abdul was the best player on the pitch because he was encouraged to play. And he had guys around him who responded to the way that he was always trying to promote the promote the ball. And I was just I came away not only half the current 
back on the show about entertaining things well you know you have to be entertainers there's, there's that sort of almost unwritten philosophy at Leeds as well um, and that winning isn't enough it's actually how you win that's why they didn't like Brian McDermott McDermott out that's what that was the, that was the thing uh, Christian Wolf, the, the pragmatists now at St Helens um, 28 nil though um, uh, what, what about Salford how did they play? Because um, I read in the paper, Tui Lollahea is, is now a target for the Huddersfield Giants, who was amusing that Kenny Edwards, after the match, the first thing he said was process in his interview with Jenna Brooks, and also was referred to on Twitter by at least one person involved in rugby league as Greg Luganis, for anyone who watched the game, which was a brilliant reference for the teenagers. Um, Huddersfield haven't got that got rid of that from their game yet. I don't know if that's part of their process. Uh, but Salford, I, I'm concerned about them, uh, Andrew. Is my concern misplaced? No, I, to be honest, they had quite a, a lot of possession, certainly in the first half. They never looked like scoring. They just never looked like they had a cutting edge. And I think Kevin Brown's a, a fantastic player, but there just didn't seem to be enough around him. They didn't seem to have many options. And, and I think they had there was one period of play where they had three sets back-to-back, you know, where they forced a couple of dropouts. And, and Saints look really comfortable defending against them. Um, so with Salford, there's always that churn of players. So you struggle to maintain consistency. And they've done incredibly well, if you look at, obviously, the past couple of seasons, some, some of the achievements that they've made. But how long can you stretch that rope? And if you haven't got the resources and you're constantly losing players at some point, there's going to be that there's going to be that breaking point where they're just not as consistent and they're not reaching those levels. So I think you're right to have those concerns. You know what's bizarre is for a long time I would have said Wakefield's problem was the churn of players, but now it's probably that there hasn't been the churn of players and there's probably a few who've been there a bit too long and haven't improved or don't add as much as they did. You talk about ball steals, Phil. It, it didn't make the highlights on Sky because they you know there's only so much room because you've got to put in all Fran Goldthorpe's tries. Um, and we'll talk more about the women's super league later. But um Emma Kershaw, former guest on this program, hell of a one on one ball steal in the game. Um brilliant, brilliant, brilliant. Uh, we didn't score from it, but it don't matter because it was great. Um I don't know the rules, so I'm uh, completely uh ambivalent to whatever decision Robert Hicks did or didn't make. Um, those calling for his head and uh, that he should be dropped, would they also call for Tino Arona to be dropped for throwing that bloody stupid pass in front of his own sticks? I think um, Chris Chester summed it up in his absolute desperate disappointment um, when he said, you know, may or may not have been a, a contentious call, but Conrad Horrell shouldn't have been 60 metres up the field in the first place. And uh, I think there are there are certain things within that game that, that Wakefield will look at and go, we did enough to win it, but we were also the masters of our own downfall. There, there were a couple of really poor decisions. I mean, you look at, again, the um, the performance of Joe Weston, and there's a guy who could not have done any more for his team. He was the outstanding player on the field. But sometimes you know, there'll be moments in a match where you've just got to nail them. Otherwise, there's always an opportunity that's going to come back and haunt you right at the very end. And it, 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 it's very hard for me to say because clearly you know that <laughs> I, I'm quite happy with the outcome. But the um, it didn't boil down to that decision. And whether that decision is right or wrong is is almost a wider decision as well about what is the ball steal rule um, and how is it impacting on the game at the moment? And have we asked too much in a period of covid um, you know, have we, have we changed what the game looks like in essence because you're bringing too much too soon? Um, if we knew we weren't going to have scrums, was that the right time to to bring in the six again as 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 we've seen it operate? I, I, I don't know because I'm I'm old and the danger is you always then uh, oh it was always better in my era and we <laughs> need to go back to five yards and there isn't a John Holmes anymore. So I think you you have got to you know look at the repercussions of what you're doing. And I'll I tell you what concerned me slightly more. Um, I went to watch an under-16s game on um, Under-16s is a funny age because some of them are on the verge of playing open age and some of them haven't yet fully developed into, uh, into full teenagers yet uh, in, in terms of their physical presence. And there was one team who was clearly lighter and, um, and, and, novices in terms of, of how often they played the game. There's, there was a team that, you know, if you didn't 
have a beard, you weren't in a team. They, they were big lads. Um, so there was always going to be a physical mismatch. But even at that level, they're playing six again. So the team that isn't physically as strong and is going to be struggling to keep pace with their opposition purely on a physical basis had periods in that game where they just could not get their hands on the ball because what they were trying to do was, was, was you know, have some degree of parity in the physical collision that they weren't going to win. But if you're then going to start penalising for, for the six again, they're never going to get hold of the ball. Uh, and I just think we, we've we've introduced something and, and, and put it throughout the sport and not thought of the full implications of it, uh, which is a long-winded way of saying Robert Hicks may or may not have got that decision wrong, but that wasn't my way of feeling the loss. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm in one of my periods of um, disconnect from the team. I don't know why. I go through these periods of, I don't know, just a bit meh. But I'll, I'll, I'll get it back eventually. We'll be all right. We just got to beat Lee a couple of times and we'll be all right. Um, they, they they lost to Wigan, but they are better than Wigan because they beat them in 2017. So that's all, <laughs> that's all we need to say. Because I, I I genuinely, um, I know I, I don't think accreditation's open yet for the semi-finals and the women's final, is it? Because um, I've not had an email through yet. Unless, not unless yet. Be, the the no. women's semi-finals you've got yeah. to apply for. I, I, I can't go. I can't go on Sunday because I'm working, sadly. Um, but I, I would like to go to the, the final. And it's in Lee, so I don't want to say anything that would prejudice me. And uh, I don't Can know, I, I, might, say it then? I might not be able to get in. I might not be able to get in because you know, I'm... You, you, well, you can say what you want, Andrew. You know, this is uh, this is an open for. Well, you can say whatever you want within reason. Let me let me put it that way. This is it's not like some rugby league personalities' twitters, you know, where they can, you know. But you I can just, say what you want. I, I just, I just think that certain people in rugby league don't do themselves, the clubs or the sport any favours. I'll leave it at that. I think you've raised another interesting point, though, about the selection of the venue. And I, and I think we need to say that clearly the RFL were limited to where they could take this game, with which pitches are available. And, but I also think that where you decide to take big matches says a lot about who you are and the impression that that gives to the outside world. So... Absolutely nothing against Lee whatsoever. It's a it's a you know mm. boutique stadium built to modern specification. If you want to get there by train, unlucky. But um, by staging the game at Lee, you are almost reinforcing the image of of who you are and what you are. And I don't know whether, for example, York was available again. I know that the women's semi-finals are being played there. But if you're talking about a ground of a certain capacity. Uh, you know, 600 fans from each of the competing men's team there, then um, a a bespoke stadium that is brand new in a city that is known as a tourist destination says something about you. I think, you know, if you want to be really innovative, for want of a word, the the sport... That's headroom. (laughs) We've got a magic weekend that's supposed to be played at Newcastle. We've promoted Newcastle to the championship. We, we as a sport, perhaps want to be seen as progressive, uh, maybe a little bit expansionist. So you take a match like that to a place like Newcastle, which again has the right sort of um, uh, capacity, and it says something about your sport. By taking it to Lee... Sometimes you might get what you deserve when it comes to people thinking of what you are. Well, this was a, a vague point of discussion on Sunday at uh, the Rockets. Um, why not York? Why, why not even Headingley? I don't know if there's some rebunion or something or cricket on, I don't know. They're the playing playing cricket. And I think ah. that there is a da- there's a danger at the moment that you don't want fans on both sides of a stadium when you're trying That's to control. Right. So I think that, I think there were some alternative options that they couldn't that, you know, yeah. I, I think any any team that, that shares with a football side that the pitch is being ripped up at the moment. So they were limited, but but my point is not whether Lee is the right or the wrong venue. It's what it says to the outside world about your sport. It's uh, it is what it is, as we say about these things. I'm worried we can't get a connection to North Leeds. We, we're, we're speaking to someone in Australia in a bit, 
Okay, I mean, I'm concerned about our, our internet connection. Why does it drop out again? You, you keep dropping out, yeah. But it's all right. We, we, get, the, we get the point. You know, we should go to Newcastle, not, not Lee. You know, or so. York. Or York. I, 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 was, I, I mean, I was looking forward to going to York um, last year when we were going to play Toronto, but uh, that didn't happen for, for many various reasons. But never mind. Uh, I am looking forward to when, when we uh, speak to our guests in Australia about the NRL, um, speaking of Toronto and failed businesses, uh, looking forward to talking about the uh, what, the new perspective on of an NRL franchise in New Zealand. Because that, that'll be exciting, won't it? Because you know, what a great success that was. Um, up the balls. Um, so we talked about all the Super League action, I think. Because um, we can't watch everything. Um, in the Championship yesterday, Dewsbury beat Swinton 20 points to 18. Featherson beat Oldham 68-0. Our, our poor friends from the Oldham podcast who went to that game. Featherson's got a railway station as well. They could have played the semi-finals in Feb. Um, Sunday, uh, Whitehaven lost to Toulouse 66-0. Uh, Toulouse are having a great season this year because uh, with every game they win, uh, people go, oh, they should have been in Super League instead of Lee because Lee are rubbish and Toulouse are great. Uh, York beat Witness 35-14, but that scoreline doesn't tell half the story, um, he says, judging by Twitter. Um, and now I have to scroll down all the Yorkshire Junior scores while you talk about about that. Uh, by the way, was the team from uh, that the uh, with the beards were they from South Leeds? Uh, no, they were from South Yorkshire. Oh well, <laughs> that, that makes it even better. Um, well, I've, I've just got to navigate the uh, RFL website. Bear with me. Championship Saturday, London beat Batley forty points to six. That's it. <laughs> That's all I was looking. Uh, the exciting thing, though, is League One, because, uh, as we all know in this program, we are very much, we're neutral, apart from we are pro Coventry Bears, and they beat West Wales, Rangy Chase and all, 36-10. Uh, Hunslet beat North Wales, not a good weekend for Wales, 26 points to 18. Uh, Doncaster beat Rochdale, 30-22. Barrow, 40. Keithley, 18. And Workington, 50. London Scholars, 16. That's the score lines from the Championship and League One. So people can now moan that we've not talked enough about the Championship and League One. But that's a very good result for uh, Coventry. I mean, I've, I've not seen any of the tries or anything, but uh, that was a good result, at least. Yeah, absolutely. I think, uh, apart from up the Bears, yeah. um, it, it shows that they are becoming more competitive, but as indeed were their opponents. Mm. Um so, again, th- there are real concerns about what is going to happen to that division in the light of the renegotiated television deal and how much of it will filter down and, you know, how 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 do you spread the jam so that everybody gets a little bit of it. And the worry is now that the, the size of the pot that it's coming from is one of those mini ones rather than a, a jumbo one. Um, and there are a lot of people saying, well, what do the likes of, you know, Coventry and... Uh, and, and South Wales or West Wales or uh, anywhere outside of, you know, the M62 corridor bring to the game. And, uh, uh, yeah, we've, we've had this discussion a million times. Um, it's what you want them to bring to the game. By the way, Andrew, is your mate Kev ever trying to topple the uh, Kieran Cunningham statue in the uh, style of the Iraqis and Saddam Hussein? <laughs> I think, I think it's only a matter of time before he goes feral and attempts. That's, that's hitting it with his slippers. Um, yeah, I mean, obviously, Kieran Cunningham, absolutely legendary player. Um, but we all know sometimes great players don't make great coaches. And, and I think we go back to the, the, the point Phil made before about States being a bit more conservative. I just think I'm not sure anybody at the moment is playing fluent attacking rugby on a consistent basis. I don't think anybody's particularly hit form. You look at Warrington, one week pretty good, one week a bit ordinary. Same almost with Catalan, with Hull. I think I think sides are adapting to these new rules quite slowly. Um, and I think as the season goes on, I think we will start to see some some attacks click. But yeah, bless him, Kieran as a coach. It was, oh God, it was attritional to watch. <laughs> Are you concerned you're going to lose Theo Farge, by the way? Because it seems that he's linked with everyone at the moment, especially the uh, the Catalans. Yeah, the, the, the talk last night was that um, apparently he's agreed to sign for Huddersfield next year. Yeah. I think I think the, the way I look at it is, I mean, obviously he's, he's been part of a, a double title win inside, but we've got Lewis Dodd, who's just this really highly rated prospect. When he's come on this year, he's given us an urgency, some dynamic. Um, uh, a dynamic uh, from and he's and he's playing in a position he's not used to. He's playing out out of position at hooker. I really want to see him as a young English halfback be given 
the, the chance to play with Johnny Lomax and Lachlan Coote and James Roby. So I think Saints, obviously they've upgraded Lomax's contract, Wormsley's. There's only so much salary cap to, to, to go around. And Farge might be one of those players who 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 moves on. I think I think the likes of Amor and maybe even LMS might move on at the end of the year. And, and I don't know what James Roby's plans are for playing another 12 months. Or so. I think there's going to be a, a, a lot of churn at Saints at the end of the season. And as we saw at Leeds, when a lot of what's the phrase generational players retired, it's it's the challenge to build that new thing, which Prime McDermott was able to do to an extent, and that'll be the challenge for Christian Wolf or whoever is in charge next year. We've had it before when we had, you know, Long, Cunningham, Schoolthorpe, Wellens, and, and they all sort of went, you know, not, not too far away from each other. And we were incredibly lucky that how do you replace Kieran Cunningham? Well, you've got James Roby. Um, I'm not sure you can replace James Roby. He's, I genuinely think he's not human because to play rugby league for such a long time, I mean, we look at Kyle Eastman, you know, the, the news this week, Rugby league is such a brutal and demanding sport and to reach those levels consistently week after week for the best part of 15, 16 years, it's incredible, isn't it? Uh, just full of admiration for him. I just want to touch on Leeds and we'll talk about Kyle Eastman in a minute, Phil. And there's, there's a criticism of Leeds that obviously they had that great generation of players that came through their academy. And then there's another generation that have come through the academy and play elsewhere, the likes of uh, McShane and obviously Gail's gone back there. Uh, and it seems now there's another generation coming through that are going to be very good. And we're seeing them come through into the first team now, probably because there's so many injuries. But it doesn't like there's another generation of very talented youngsters in this Leeds Rhinos uh, system. I think that was the saving grace on uh, uh, Friday night that um, the two best players I thought for Leeds were two of their young teenage uh, prodigies. You know, yeah, you know, I thought Morgan Gannon coming off the bench made an absolutely massive impact, and Jarrell O'Connor's work rate throughout the game was incredibly impressive. Um, and yeah, you've got the likes of you know Harry Newman to add into that, Sam Walters who, who they picked up from Widners. Um, that yes, there, there are a group of young kids who clearly um, have talent, um, but with every team, including some of the great Saints names that Andrews just mentioned, they don't come in and win. They come in and learn their craft and they, they do that by making mistakes. And, and every great young player has had to earn his spot. It's it's not a given. And there's a, again, I don't want to use the word process, but the, uh, the, the you know, the, there's, a, there's a growing up that you've got to go through. Um, you know, I, I look at somebody like Mikel at the moment, who has just been called into the, um, you know, the England squad. And, and, and it's taken him two years to fully understand the role of a prop in the modern game. It's not that he didn't have the physique to do it. You know, it's, a, it's, it's something that you need to learn. Like in any trade, you know, you, you arrive as an apprentice, you don't suddenly get sent out on the, a major job. You, you've got to make the tea to begin with and you've got to learn, you know, which brick is which and how you mix the cement. And, and it's absolutely no different in, in rugby league. I think the, um, th- there is a concern, I think, and, and going back to the Farge thing, I, I'm absolutely certain he will be leaving St Helens because halfbacks are in such demand at the moment and the two that clearly will be on the market look like being Truman and Farge so they are going to um you know they're, they're going to attract premium money and and good luck to them if they can get it but that's how a salary cap is supposed to work if Lewis Dodds is waiting in the wings and needs to be given his opportunity there's always somebody that's got to drop off the top of the conveyor belt to allow you to fill it at the bottom the worry, I think, and it, it, again, it's not a worry just because of a, an age thing, is we're not getting the quality coming through at the bottom at the moment. There are certain star names and players at each of the clubs, but there isn't that competition for places at the moment that you would like. Um, and I think that is a concern of the sport. I, I have another concern, which, again, I don't know whether um, Andrew has heard anything or, or, or shares, and that is that... that I just think towards the end of this season, a lot of our overseas players are going to go home, uh, whether they're out of contract or not. I think one of the effects of COVID uh, will be that they have been kept apart either from their own very young families or away from 
more elderly relatives who who you know might have health issues and whereas in the past if there was an issue you could jump on a plane and be back and uh, or there were gaps in the season where you would allow your overseas players to go home or uh, you know they look at their country and say i don't know when i might be allowed back in again and under what circumstances and and where i'm living at the moment i even though uh, you know i might be a citizen of that country i might end up like the australian cricketers that played in the ipl and 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 either have to quarantine and unfortunately for them it had to be in the maldives but you know not not the back streets of tin twistle or wherever but um I just think there are a lot of overseas players at every club, some very significant players, some names who uh, are box office, who are going to go home at the end of the year. So you look at, for example, St. Helens, and I I have not heard for sure, but I don't think Kevin Aguam will be there next year. I, I don't think Lachlan Coote will be there next year. Um, you look at Huddersfield, the fact that they're in the market for Theo Farge and, and being linked with two or three other halfbacks, I don't think, I think they already know that Aidan Caesar isn't going to be there next year. Um, I, I think, you know, there's, there's a couple of players at Leeds who, who I, think, I, I don't think Reese Martin is going to stay over here. Um, I think Matt Pryor's looking at what, you know, he, he very nearly didn't come back because of issues that it meant leaving a very young family behind and really not knowing when he'd see them again. And, and I'm not saying that any of these are done deals. So, you know, I am just looking at the talent that is spread across this game and wondering how we would fill that gap if some of those players went home. Um, and, I, and that is a concern that I think affects every club. Phil, you're absolutely right. And I think it's not just the, um, you know, being away from family, worried about them in another country and having that 15 months apart, which must have been terribly hard. I also think if you look at any overseas players who joined a club last year, Whereas normally they would be able to make friends with other players' families and, and, and have the normal school experience and start to socialise, they've been incredibly isolated. So if you, th- if you think you come to a, a new country, probably what George Williams and Luke Thompson are experiencing over in the NRL at the moment were their partners. You know, it's OK for the player because they're going to get to training every day. They, they've got a, a little bit of a routine, but it's the families and it's the impact of that and and some of the names you mentioned yet yeah, I, I don't expect to see Kevin Nagama or Lachlan Clute at, at Saints next season because understandably they, 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 they're going to want to get back and, and see the families and sort out uh, education and things like that it's been a very very difficult time and I think for overseas players more so for the, for the points that you've outlined you know I also think well, I was going to say, I also think that most of those players, you, you can add in the likes of Blake Austin, and that they they will all pick up a contract um, in the NRL, and and it won't be, it may be more lucrative because they're clearly their their salary cap is higher than ours, but but the fact is they would be able to go home and play without worrying about all the extraneous things in their lives, which which is a not about money at all, um, and they will pick up a deal in the NRL, and and I just don't think it. We won't be able to compete with people understandably wanting to go home. Um, and that's nothing to do with money. I, I just think we we have to be aware that whilst every team is producing some youngsters that we need to give an opportunity, there's, there are going to be some massive holes to be filled. And I, I genuinely do have concerns that we are producing the right calibre of youngster who can play at first team level um, at every club across the board. I mean, as we know, I I know nothing, and I am not a journalist. But uh, from what I'm told, this is secondhand information. It would take silly money to prize Jake Truman away from Castleford. So make of that what you will. I don't think he's going. From from what everyone's said, I don't think he's going anywhere. Whether well, the that's question will be. Around, you know. The other question will be: Would Castleford be able to afford to keep him? Because yeah. ev- the other thing, apart from the overseas players may be leaving, is that everybody, whether they it's it's announced or not, will be working on a much lower salary cap. Because the fact that you're allowed to spend £2 million, if you are only going to be spending 1.6 because that's all you've got, then some of your high earners or higher earners will, will have to leave. But also anything you've got that is a valuable asset, you may have to cash in. Um, and it may well be that uh, because Truman is in such demand that a club will pay a £150,000 transfer fee for him. Well, apparently they've already turned down 200. 
which is the uh, well, that's what John Davidson said in his column, and we said on here a couple of weeks ago, and someone heard me say it and said, "Well, you said that," and I said, "Yeah," because I had read John Davidson say it. Because I don't know any news. And here's here's proof I don't know anything. Um, on Sunday, when I was at the uh, the Women's Super League games at the home of Rugby League, um, and I can't wait for them to uh, install the hand sanitizers outside the gents' toilets outside the main stand at Bellevue. <laughs> um, <laughs> Which I think have been there since Queen Victoria was on the throne, uh, which is a poor Well, she was in phrase. silent. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I thought she was, she was using those ones. Um, I, I didn't realise that Ashley Hyde had uh, come back from having a baby. I, I, I heard that she'd come back. Um, so I assumed injury, which I wrote in my initial uh, blurb on my uh, on the YouTube video. Uh, and then swiftly changed after I'd heard she come back seven weeks after giving birth, which is not an injury. That that's not injury. So uh, so I didn't realise when I interviewed her when I asked, "So you uh, what's it what's it like?" To, thankfully, the question was, "What's it like to get back on the pitch?" You know, I, I got away with it, but uh, I didn't know. I didn't know. Pre- I didn't know. It, and if you read the pre-match preview, it wasn't anywhere. You need to help people. You have to spoon feed people about these things. Don't tell us after. Tell us before, and then then we'll know. Um, h- h- how's the book, Andrew? With uh, I'm not going to name her. <laughs> she must not be named. Yeah, um, no. Danica's self isolating at the moment, but she does <laughs> not have COVID. She does. She, she does. This is official. Yeah. official. The girl. The, the she, girl does not have COVID. Yeah. She does not have COVID. Obviously. Um, well. Uh, the process went really good considering we were writing during the pandemic. Uh, sent the book to Danica a couple of months ago, but obviously she's a media magnet now. She's back playing. She works full time. So because she's self-isolating, I'm hoping, Danica, you're reading the book as we speak. Well, she does me, listen to this podcast. And you'll drop me a little text sure. saying either, yes, I like it, or no, I don't, and we can do some work. But I know she was really pleased with the surprise forward that, 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 that I sorted out for her, so... Was, which was Barry McDermott, and thanks, thanks to Barry and a few other people who've spoken to, like Thomas Brindle, who've been very giving of the time. Um, it, it's been really appreciated, but I'm really, really pleased with it. And I can't wait for people to read it. I've seen Leeds have got a stunt double for her. Sorry, sorry, Hornby. She's she's Danica Prim's stunt double. I couldn't believe it when I was because I'm, I'm at the game and I'm, I'm watching on Twitch because obviously you know when you're watching the game in front of you, you may as well watch on the telly because you can see it better. And I'm, I'm looking like. Whoa. It's her. No, it's not her. But uh, Leeds won, which, you know, I'll tell you what, that first 15 minutes, it looked a bit ropey. But um, they won in the end. Not a good weekend for Wakefield against Leeds. But uh, so we just got to try. That was good. And uh, the, the, the problem with Twitch is the cameras aren't close enough to see the 4020 TV logo on, on the Wakefield shirts. But <laughs> um, Fran Goldthorpe, five tries. Caitlin Beaver's got a hat trick. Um, could Goldthorpe score 10 ga- tries in a game like Martin Fire? She she possibly could. No one can stop her. She just, uh, Leon Price said on commentary, she's got that innate ability which can't be taught. Just that step, and it's great to watch. I, I cannot wait for this weekend's game oh. in the the women's semi-finals because, you know, we all have said and we knew that the early fixtures were going to see some blowout scores because of the way they were structured. Um, so not a surprise, but you could not have two better clashes this weekend. The, the history already behind Leeds and Saints and the fact that virtually every time they've, they've played in, a, in, a, in an important game, it's gone to the very last play and... Um, you know, Saints have, have recruited magnificently. Um, they look to be the favourites against a team that, you know, the holders, uh, double holders of of the championship. Now, if that doesn't water your mouth, then the thought of York and, and Castleford and everything that's gone on between them playing at, on the same ground on the same day, you know, th- this is a massive opportunity to, 
to sell the women's game. Um, and I think what we've seen on Twitch, which has been highlighted on Sky, has, has been great profile. And, and I think we're the only ones that are saying, oh, there's a there's a gap in standard between some of the teams. I, I think people who've not seen it before are generally seem to be saying there's a huge level of skill. There's a woman there that scored five tries. There's a, Look at that hit, one-on-one, uh, you know, hit. What what more? Look at that offload from, from that came out the back of the hand. You know, they're, they're not worried about necessarily who's beating who. To this weekend, they will get that even more competitive element attached to it. And um, I cannot pick the winners of either of those teams, uh, either of those ties. And, and you know, if you get the chance to go or watch, then uh, pl- please take it because it'll it, it'll be among the best rugby you will see this season, men or women. I'm I'm gutted that I can't be there, but uh, but I've got to work. So so what can I do? Um, York are confident. York are confident. If you haven't seen the interviews after the game, Lindsay Anfield, Rhiannon Marshall, they're confident. You know, this this is a big rivalry. It's fallen into our laps. We should be building this up every single day of the week because there's nothing else going on this weekend. Is it the final day of the Premier League? Who cares? It's finished. It's done. You know, there's, there's nothing else going on. I don't even know what's going on in Super League this week because I'm not particularly interested <laughs> because it's the start of the season. This is the coming towards the end of a competition where we've got two great stories. I've got to tip Saints because I always tip Saints and Leeds win, so I, I won't get told off. But um, two cracking semi-finals in prospect, and I'm like, if I mean it's Saints, the, the 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 bridesmaids, but this year. I don't want to say this will be their year because obviously that that, that invokes the, the wrong things, uh, Andrew. But uh, positive thoughts around St Helens. Yeah, and but because of the delicate situation of of, of my friend who <laughs> plays for Leeds, can I be Switzerland in this and just say I'm neutral? <laughs> I, but no, these two games this weekend. I mean York and Castleford, and, and and obviously the the transfers of the players, and that is absolutely dynamite, and it's going to be an incredible game and. And, you know, York were particularly impressive against Wigan, I thought, from, from what I saw of that. And then Saints and Leeds just writes itself. And, and obviously, a, a couple of weeks ago, you had a players on from, from, from different women's Super League sides and, 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 and the Saints interview was great. We're going to win the treble, no problem. And, and that's what you want. You want people to, to, to say that. And I think you can't pick a winner in either game. And I'm not going to. And you can't make me. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, one thing that was... A point that was raised to me, which I will, I will, I agreed with, and it was interesting, was in terms of the the broadcasting. They probably should use more female voices on the games. Perhaps, I'm not a fan of having lots of voices because I think the best commentaries are when you've got two. But if you are going to try out new voices. And he, you know, Phil's done summaries for years, so he he can tell you how difficult it is. I've done it a couple of times, and it is hard if you don't have the if you don't have the rugby league brain to analyse what you've seen in front of you. You're just repeating what you've seen in front of you, and and, and that's rubbish. And I and I wasn't very good at it, so I can uh, I, I can attest to that. So you've got to give people a chance, and if you give people a chance on Twitch, you're not giving them you're not throwing them in at the deep end on national television, which is what we tend to do, which is not good. So I would be in favour of, and as we've seen, there are plenty of people in the women's game who can speak well. Just give them a chance, stick them alongside the best in the business and a another, and see how they go. You Just can't. to add a bit more of a perspective, because um, they they know the players better than anyone else, and can add a bit that we can't, or the you know the ex players can't. Not to say don't have. Early on, Price alongside because he was brilliant on Sunday. He was very uh, complimentary about everyone, and uh, it, it, you just need a you know different experience perspective alongside. Perhaps I don't know. I'm, I'm... I think you're right, Rich, and I think uh, you know referring back to Danica, she's obviously she has been thrown in, in in the deep end on the red button, and I think she's been fantastic. I think she you know she's enthusiastic. Unless you're a certain ex player who said she talks too much, that was good. Well. <laughs> You know, um, there's unfortunately some misogynistic dinosaurs associated with various um, 
elements of the game. But I thought Danica was superb. She'll continue to get better. I, many years ago at Knowsley Road, there was a, a row of uh, blind supporters and I did commentary for them along. And I was doing the summarising role um, for, in the, like the 1995 God season. And um, <laughs> it's an incredibly difficult skill to, to talk people through through the game. Um, and, and as I say, I think Danica's done exceptionally well. Jordy Cunningham, I think, comes across really well. And there are others. And, and, and as we build towards the World Cup, like you say, let's give people the opportunity on Twitch to get that experience so that when they're on BBC Sky later in the year, it, they're not as overawed as maybe they could be. I mean, we saw with, with um, Inside Super League, which could have been something and it, and it ended up being nothing because obviously everything fell apart due to COVID. I thought that Lois Fossell got a lot of criticism and she was thrown in at the deep end because she's not the trained TV presenter. She's a rugby league player. So you can't expect her to just turn up and become a TV presenter overnight. It's a different skill. And that's where you need to... I think some people think you just turn up and talk. That's why everyone set up a podcast or whatever while we've been in lockdown. It's not as simple as it looks, as we prove every week. Very difficult. Although we do, we do make it look pretty simple, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm, I'm in front of me. I've got uh, some drawers and there's some cassettes in there, and I can see in front of me there's a cassette I recorded in 1992 of me trying to do football commentary, and I know it's dreadful, and I would have been 11 at the time, and I don't think I've listened to it back since then. But I've got it there to remind me that, you know, you can improve. You, know, you can always get better at what you what you do. I should listen back to it and see how bad it actually is. But uh, you should put it on YouTube. I should do, actually. I should transfer it. I did enjoy the two games of the weekend, though. And, and you know, Leeds got better as the game went on. Where if you didn't give up seven players under 18 or 10 players under 18 or 19 or something. One debutant and never played a competitive game of the league before. Uh, the try was good because Leeds let the ball bounce, which is always funny. Um, but then it, they got angry and then scored lots of tries in the second half, which was not good. But, you know, credit to Danny Swain. She always fronts up and speaks to us after the match. Um, and Leeds, by example, proper captain. Some others at clubs should lead by her example. Um, Featherston York afterwards. What, what, a, what a game in conditions. First half, lovely. Second half, rain. Um, if you've seen the interviews afterwards, you'll see the rain pittering down in the uh, stand behind us. Uh, Featherson played the conditions better at the start of the second half. They'll be all right, Fev. Um, oh, congratulations, Andrew Dobson. New job today is a uh, development mm. officer in, in Sheffield, which is great for the sport in South Yorkshire. Um, Saints beat Warrington 54-6. Uh, York won 42-14 in the end. And Huddersfield, congratulations to them. Uh, beating Bradford 28-20. Massive result for the Giants. So obviously... Uh, First season in the in the women's super league, very young squad from all we're told. That is a big result over a established super league force, albeit a depleted one. But that's a that's a big marker down result. Which again shows you that um, we are building something, and and clearly if you say you know the Wakefield team, half of that is um, is, is women who are you know are teenagers still then. That, that's your stepping stone and it goes back to what we were saying about you know youngsters in in the men's game do not expect them to win when they first take the field because your your, your competition is demeaned if they can just arrive and be successful you, you you have to come up against far more experienced opposition and learn what it takes to overcome them so that I, I think the the only other sort of topic that we skirted on and, and haven't really mentioned is is the retirement of Kyle Eastman oh yes, um, yes. Which again is probably not relevant to the women's game, but comes back to how hard this sport is to play, which is relevant to the women's game. Um, I noticed a, a lot of criticism both of him, but but probably more of the Leeds club. Um, quite a lot of it from Leeds fans saying, you know, it's it's an embarrassment. Why? Um, you know, how how could either of these parties lose um, to at least give him a shot? Um, the game has clearly. Firstly, there is a shortage of halfbacks. You know, we've already discussed that. That uh, you know, the primary position in rugby league where there is the scarcest, the most scarce resource is in a halfback. So, if a guy who is a proven halfback is on the market, you you would actually be foolish not to give him a trial. 
But what it shows us, perhaps, is that how much the game has changed over the last 10 years since he's been away from it and and what you need to do um, to be successful and make a contribution under the current rules and regulations is different to the game that he left. And I don't think anybody doubts the skill. Um, and I don't think anybody doubts the fact that he is, to us mere mortals, an incredibly athletic and fit person. But what you need to play rugby league these days is just enormous. And um, it's something else we've got to be wary of. You have to be a certain level of athlete, even at community level now, to, to play this game. And we call ourselves inclusive. You've just got to be very careful that because of the rules and because of uh, you know the way the sport is played at the moment, we're not stopping people who want to play, play the game. Um, and I just think it's a very another salutary lesson about, you know, whether it, whether it was a, a gamble or not, uh, which clearly it was because it, it it hasn't worked. Something's happening in the sport at the moment where someone who is clearly born and brought up with it doesn't feel that physically they can play it at this at, you know, point in their career. Um, so I, I don't attach blame to either party. In fact, if anything, their honesty should be. Uh, rewarded you know he could have said every week in training I'm getting there I'm getting there I'm getting there and never played and the club could have said we need you there we need you there we need you there and but actually you know somebody's had a realization that it is not going to work and the parties have uh, a, a party as, as amicably as you would expect in these circumstances well, why would that be a criticism uh, I just think it just says something about where perhaps the sport might be at the moment do you think Leeds will go into the transfer market in the short term, Phil? I mean, there's not much availability of halfbacks, but do you think they might look to replace him in the short term? I think the problem they've got is who would they go for? I mean, A, you've got to have some money available and money, as we all know, at every club is incredibly tight. But who isn't playing at the moment who could walk into a first team role in a halfback position? Um, I think they are on the lookout to recruit. Um, but I don't, you know, if you were to draw up a shortlist of available people who are either coming out of contract that their current clubs would be prepared to release a little bit early, um, who, who is there? Who's, who in the championship would you go for that you think could make the, an immediate step up? Um, who is available? You know, Jonathan Ford, who might be worth a shot at Super League level because Toulouse a player. You know, he's just re-signed with Toulouse and, and he's at the, again, the older A end of his career. Um, I, I think they probably are waiting for Robert Louis to come back, who I'm told is only a couple of weeks away from maybe being available. And, and to the end of this season, that sort of Louis, Myler, Gale combination, maybe with McClelland coming in as well when he's fit. That might just see them through. But yes, I think they'll be in the market. Who's available? Think about Jordan Lilly. There you go. He, he did well against New Zealand that time, whenever that was, a million years ago. Um, Andrew, we, we've got to go to Australia. So uh, we, we, we thank you very much for your time. Um, I, I, fingers crossed she's read the book. Because um, obviously she's got no excuses now. Um, if not, give her a hundred lines or something. Whatever teachers have to do. do. Do teachers still give out lines? I don't know. Are they allowed to do that? I don't know. It's, it's been a long time since I've been at school, um, as as proven by my English on on Twitter at times. Um, are, are you working on it? Oh, I forgot to ask. Um, how's Doug Lawton? Because he's he's a regular character on this program and will be again in the future. But I, I obviously you worked on his book in the past, and I know you spoke to him last week. Yeah, Doug turned 77 last Thursday and he rang me last Friday morning and it's the most joyous 50-minute conversation I've ever had. Most of it unrepeatable. Uh, there was quotes on Volta, Sean Wayne, the modern game, um, a sawn off shotgun in the, in Queensland. He was on absolute rare form and I'm hoping uh, we can we can meet up in, in person at, at some point. But yeah, he's, he, he was hilarious as ever. Does he ever mention... Uh... The other one, the other person we don't name? Uh, the one with no Wi-Fi? No. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I like the idea that this is all a one-way street. And, and he, he, he mentions him all the time. And he, he just, uh, He's just not aware of his presence. <laughs> As indeed he wasn't at the time. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Bit out of show. Uh, we, we, we can get your books, Andrew. And we should order them through Phil's shop, obviously. But uh, yeah. they're all, we can get them online and, you know, and, and 
which and and your your new your ladies book will be out whenever it's out whenever it's we'll, we'll get you back on to talk about it and um, she might come on well, we'll have to ask i don't ask her anymore because now she's like you say multimedia superstar Dang. she mates with like tanya off the telly and stuff you know, that's... <laughs> who are we it's people with a podcast it's... can't compete with that anymore uh, andrew thank you very much for your time uh, enjoy the rest of the season. Fingers crossed you are allowed back into the ground again soon. Uh, give our love to Kev because um, uh, we're, we're big fans because um, Rugby League needs more miserable people. I, I you know, I, I, I feel the solidarity with him. It's going to be unbearable after listening to all this prayer. <laughs> <laughs> You're creating a monster now. <laughs> that's, that's what we do. That is what we do. Uh, Andrew, a pleasure as always. Great to speak to you both. Uh, so we're back um, and we are now heading to Australia, which is a big place. Um, and uh, George Clark joined. Whereabouts in Australia are you, George? I'm in Sydney. Sydney. I've heard of that one. Um, from Fox Sports, from 4020 Magazine, of course, our correspondent there for the NRL. How are things over there, George? Yeah, good. Uh, I'd just like to start by saying... Um... Long-time listener, first-time caller. So I remember when I listened to you guys when I was cleaning my university flat out after Magic Round in 2015. So that was, I was in Newcastle. Um, so I remember when you were at Radio Yorkshire. So yeah, things are good in Australia. We're kind of probably a bit, you know, a uh, bit, for, you know, very fortunate compared to the rest of the world and actually being so far away that COVID's kind of stayed away more or less. Um, so yeah, I just want to get home and have a, a pint of landlord and you know shut well, them on side somewhere you know well it's almost finished here now because we're allowed out and everything so uh yeah, you know, it's, yeah, it's, yeah. it's almost finished for, for, for the time being um you, you just had your, your magic round over there which is a wholly original australian concept so never done anywhere else before H- how was it uh so i think from the people i've spoken to i didn't go but the people i know who went as punters said they enjoyed it thoroughly. Uh, Brisbane is like Newcastle in that it lends itself as a city to dip in and out. Um, The first weekend they had the Thursday night game, I remember, which didn't really work because it was the Titans and they were terrible against Cronulla. So they they negotiated with the broadcasters and condensed it into two games on the Friday, three Saturday, three Sunday. Um, But yeah, everyone seems to have found the weekend itself enjoyable, but I guess the big talking point was the, um, you know, the issues around the edict that's been issued on on head high contacts, and you know, uh, that that's probably overshadowed it slightly. So last week the NRL, they, there was a Roosters Parramatta game where they missed a head high shot, and there were knees to the back of the the ribs, and this uh, Drew Hutchison, who I think played for Lee for a couple of years, didn't he? Yeah, he um, he punctured his lung. So uh, not not the kind of injury you want to get. So they then came out with this edict and obviously the reaction is worse than the initial thing. So then three guys got sent off, 15 sim bins, you know, players were, you know, ex-players were rightly saying, you know, it's not the same game. But the problem is they've sped the game up so much that now we have more chance of people making errors and, uh, you know, lazy defensive reads or getting their head in the wrong place. So, you know, um, yeah, I mean, it'll sort itself out eventually, I guess. In terms of the people who've defended this new edict, and I guess before we go any further, I should give my age away, but when you said he's from Sydney, um, I immediately went back to the old BT advert with Maureen Littman. And uh, Sydney who? Not Sydney who? Sydney, Australia. Um, Sorry, um, I just couldn't resist that. Um, The likes of Wayne Bennett and Trent Robinson are coming out saying, if it's going to teach players to alter their technique because we're in an era whereby head injuries are becoming more apparent, then surely this isn't something that should be criticised? Yeah, I guess I, I probably am more on the side of Robinson and Bennett. I think that all the all the other coaches would agree with that, right? They've all had guys who've had to sit out weeks on end or, you know, they will know older players who've retired or maybe even guys they've played with who are suffering from the long-term side effects of repeated concussion. Um, I, get, I guess the, the issue a lot of the clubs took was that it kind of was f- forced upon them on the Friday. I think Trent Barrett said he found out about it on the way to captain's run. It's okay. So this is one of the knocks on the current administration or you know, perceived knocks is that 
a lot of the policy seems to be made like on the run. And as someone said to me today, it's okay to be a dictator, but you've got to make sure, you know, everything runs, you know, the trains run on time, you know, otherwise, you know, all the other issues then get brought up and it's kind of um, amplified. So, yeah, I think everyone's, everyone's kind of, you know, Robinson and Bennett are pretty sage blokes and are pretty safe in the knowledge they won't lose their jobs this year. Um, but, you know, some coaches might be feeling the strain and think, well, you're, you know, these decisions being forced upon us mid-season is another thing to learn, you know? Um, so is it a decision or, or is it the need to amend tackling technique, which is something that, is this driven by the potential threat of litigation anyway, which is something that the game is not unaware of, that it needs to change and be seen to change? Um, and and it's, a, it's a duty of care issue. Therefore, you're not being asked to do anything you wouldn't have done in pre-season. You're just being asked to re-emphasise and enforce the fact that the head is not a target anymore. Yeah, yeah. I, I think you're probably right there, Phil. And also the fact is Rugby Union, um, excuse my French, brought in this similar edict, what, three years ago? And they, I remember there being a big furore where they, you know, they're the same issues where guys are completely innocuous knocks and they recognise they needed to make a change and the AFL has also done that here. So I think there's also a mindfulness of, yes, there's the the CTE, you know, long-term legal effect that people are concerned about, and rightfully so. But then I guess also here, because it's such a, a diverse uh, sporting pool that the other code, you know, you're worried you'll lose little Jimmy to the AFL or, or, or Union or soccer, you know, because his parents are worried about, you know, the dangers they're placing in. So, yeah, there's two elements, but lit- litigation is probably the one they're more scared of, you know. On the field, the the, the product in the NRL, is that still uh, garnering the, uh, the the attention of the uh, of the sporting public in the way it was pre-pandemic? Yeah, I think, I think in going back to these rule changes, I remember watching the first couple of games after they brought in the six again, I thought, this is great. I think... You know, now it's getting up to that time of year where Origins are a, a, a big staple and all the player market's starting to move as well. So that's quite interesting. Um, but yeah, I think the the issue the NRL are going to have is maybe the next couple of years, if these, if we continue to see these blowout score lines, which are becoming quite quite common, is the genie's almost out the bottle. So I think maybe, you know, fans might start to, you know, watch something that's a bit closer, you know? So, that, that you know, that, that that's the real threat. But, you know, day-to-day interest, you know, Everyone still still loves, you know, um, the usual stuff. And, yeah, Origin being around the corner is um, pretty exciting. Not that I care, but... You know. <laughs> well, surely you must, have, you must have picked a side by now, sure. Uh, no, nah, not really. Well, New South Wales, <laughs> well, and I, I kind of had a soft spot when I lived in England and will watch it. But kind of this is this insane kind of obsession everyone gets... Uh, over origin this like eight week period and, and it's actually been quite quiet this year but now you know the next couple of weeks all the talking heads will come out with their starting 17s and it's like well it's just another game isn't it it's just like county cricket but big like the war of the roses you know the Lancashire York um, but yeah you know once that's out of the way I think then then the season is like they, you, know, you can see the finishing line in sight and the competition starts to take place it's a nice it is a nice filler in the middle of the season because I think the NRL have got it perfect where they have magic now, Origin one in four weeks' time, and then you bang, bang, the other two, and then you're into the last home stretch finals. Should have test matches in a World Cup this year. Who knows? Um, so, yeah. Yeah, I was, I was. you've mentioned the World Cup. So, <laughs> I mean, we, whatever we say now about the World Cup can change within you know 24 minutes, let alone 24 hours. What's things looking like down under in terms of international travel and the prospect of, well, most of the teams coming over for the World Cup, let alone the Australians? But actually, this suits England down to a T because they can't, <laughs> they can't balls it up from here, can they? Um, you know, we're coming, you know, uh, one line on the shirt or whatever it is these days because they have a new badge every every time, every test match they play and a new sponsor. Um, it has it, it doesn't really get much of a it isn't widely talked about as a thing anyway, the World Cup. I think it occupies a very small, you know, it's 
niche in the mainstream media, you know, international football, which is a real shame because I think it's actually one of the most undersold parts. And once Australia realises that, and you've seen that with the origin rule, potential rule changes, they realise, oh shit, we've got this thing that AFL, our biggest rival, doesn't have. Why don't, no one said, why don't we exploit it? They've just been like, oh, it'll happen. You know, we have it at the end of the year. But I've not heard anyone say, oh, they won't travel or they will travel. And I think there's an interesting thing, if you've been following what's happened in the IPL with all the Aussie guys went over to earn however many million, many million rupees or whatever they earn. Um, they've now then been locked out of Australia and have only kind of come back in the last couple of days after a lot of kind of wrangling and rule bending. Um, so, yeah, you know, I think... Uh, you, you know, in the current state, and then not everyone's been vaccinated here. The vaccination rate has been pretty terrible. I think a lot of guys will withdraw through injury, which is a real shame. So I don't know why they don't just put it back to 22. Um, I think assuming that it does go ahead and indications are that there is a willingness for it too. Um, some of the work's got to be done over here to... to encourage players to come and feel safe and know that they're going to get back even with a, a nominal quarantine. How worried should Sean Wayne be? Because he talks a really good game about um, intensity and what, you know, the, the information overload he's giving his players to make sure that nothing that, the, that they're going to be thrown up against, they're going to be unaware of. But I get the impression watching the NRL and, and reading the kind of stuff that you're writing, that this isn't just about Australia and New Zealand anymore, that, there are better players of quality playing for all the Pacific nations or available to them. Mm. Um, but England should be seriously worried about where we rank in international rugby league at the moment. You look at who Fiji could call on, for example, and, and we'll come to Samoa in a minute if they ever got their act together. But the, the, there has been the greatest spread of international talent if we choose to use it. Yeah, and, you know, I, I'm trying to think maybe... Maybe five years ago, someone like Kevin Nagama, who's at the back end of his career playing in the Super League, would have been a shoe in for Fiji. I can't say that he is now. You know, he might he might make the squad. He might not even make this. He might not even make the squad. So that's how good their depth is because you know, every kind of NRL off season, someone's going and uh, you know, picking five blokes out of a village and saying, "You come, you know, have a go with us." And they, you know, Mike Acebo is probably the most recent example. Was playing in Gundagai, which is like kind of six hours southwest of Sydney. Penrith saw him first, I think, and then Parramatta signed him. So, you know, the talent's there. I, yeah, I would be, as a betting man, I would love to see the price that English bookmakers give Samoa in the first, in the scheduled opener, because I think there's a, there's a penny to be made there. Um, Rich is scrambling to check the odds. I think they were paying about $41 uh, the last time I heard to win the tournament. So, they one, and obviously people are expecting big things to Tonga and Fiji. So yeah, I think there probably is a case for that. Um, I certainly feel being here, you recognise the depth of the Australian talent, and you know, finally Thurston and Cronk retire, and we can see the wood for the trees. And then some bloke called Nathan Cleary comes along, and Cameron Munster, oh, and Cameron Smith's gone, but they got Damien Cook and Appy Coruscant. Like, how are they going to, you know, and Harry Grant, you know? So um, yeah. You know, it, it, it's never ending. I can't remember, I'm not completely a fan of my Greek mythology, but what's the one where they cut the head off and it grows more? It's like that. Well, we're looking blank. I, I, I was looking at Phil there because he's the one who's read all the books. But, you know, he, yeah, he should know these things. Um, they, they have, the bookmakers it's not, it's not the Hydra. Is it the Hydra? Maybe. I start with him. Anyway. So we, I Edit that bit out if it isn't. Yeah, the uh, the bookmakers haven't priced up the uh, thing yet, but fifty to one you can get on some hour over here. So uh, our hours are obviously not as uh, not as confident as the the Aussie bookies are as uh, in the uh, Samoans. Um, um, I, I should say you mentioned the AFL's international aspect. I do did love the international series where they played the Irish Gaelic football as in some kind of legalized violence uh, hybrid sport. That was always a highlight of the international uh, sporting calendar. Um, what, what's going on in Samoa then? You, you've written extensively about this. So we, we had the, the drama in Tonga a couple of years ago. Now it seems to have uh, spread to, to Samoa. So uh, there were, uh, two years ago, I got, I got a, a tip off from a player and kind of thought, oh, that's strange. 
And he told me about a coach who was a very top coach in the NRL who'd offered to, his services to Samoa. He said that the Samoan board had knocked this coach back. And I thought, that's very strange. Why would this coach knock him back? So I kind of thought, oh, you know, blah, 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 blah. I then watched them play in that 2019 test series, like they call it the Pacific Cup. It was when the, the great, great Britain tour was, was down under. Um, and I thought, Samoa played so badly. But then you look at the talent they have, and it's staggering. So they've had the same coach since 2013, Matt Parrish, and his results. Now, there's nothing to take away. He might be a great coach. He might just not have got the results. You know, it happens. But a number of players wrote a letter uh, to the Samoan Prime Minister earlier this year where they expressed concern about, about Matt Parrish as a coach. Uh, six from 20, I think, and one from his last nine. So you've got the Parrish issue and, you know, players in my article, they made, you know, a number of claims. One kind of centred around, you know, his ability to kind of navigate the cultural competency, which I think if you speak to the Tongan guys, they say Christian Wolf has done incredibly well. He understand, you know, he's fully immersed in it. Some players did feel Parrish offered them that and neither did he kind of offer the ultra professional environment you need to succeed as a as an elite athlete. You know, they referenced um referenced drinking and a lot of hangers on in the camps and so on and so forth. Um and then the second thing I think is fundamentally the the board in Samoa. So they're clearly putting Matt Parrish in in place, they've accepted him as their coach until tw the end of the 21 World Cup, and they released a statement to the same effect. Um, I think a lot of you know Samoan kids you will meet are often very polite, very unassuming, very softly spoken, and it's a, it's a it's a societal thing which we as probably gobby Westerners probably think what a loaded mumbo jumbo, but actually you know this is a thing that's passed down on from tribes from tribes through the Matai system, all this kind of thing. So standing up to uh, authority is quite a difficult thing for a lot of Samoan people to do. Um, so yeah, and they, they, you know, they've made allegations about the, the use of uh, money and whether they've been transparent with it. And that's not an issue, which is, you know, uh, just in rugby league. That's also in, in the, the union team have been plagued by that, those issues for years. So you've got these two strands and, the board obviously want to keep Parrish in and Parrish is obviously trying to put himself in the shop window for a better gig. And I think a lot of the players have just now kind of said enough is enough. But there's an extra element to this now, which again has probably catalyst. Cat, yes. Uh, been a catalyst for your story. Um, and that is the fact that the Johns brothers and Sonny Bill Williams, who is of course of Samoan heritage have now come forward and said, well, we want to take it on. We, we think that the, we get a lot of the major players to, to play for Samoa. Uh, we, we think that we can respect everything that you've just spoken about. And we think we can get more out of this hugely talented group yeah. than um, has, has currently happened. Once they get involved, media personalities all, surely the Samoan um, organisation is, is backed into such a corner that they have to allow them to be involved. So the Matty, Andrew, John slash Sonny Bill coaching trio, I don't, I don't know if they'd be a, a great coaching team. It could it could be utter chaos or it could be utter brilliant. Take, take your pick. But, I, you know, that I've been working on this since February. And then that thing came out of nowhere and no one I speak, I've spoken to uh, knows where that's come from either. So when the Johns brothers made their pitch on more or less Matthew, and then Andrew also spoke about it. Interestingly, Sonny's not really spoken about it yet. Um, but they both said, you know, we see the potential, as you mentioned, Phil. We want to harness it. And the Samoan board basically said, I don't think they went through the right channels by the sounds of things from what the Samoan board put out. Um, I don't know who their kind of contact is or or whatever. But yeah, the, the Samoan board came out and said, well, you know, make, make, we've, We've not had an official approach, and Matt Parrish is our coach. So, as far as we're concerned, business is normal. I suspect so, this this one isn't going to go away, though, is it? Because uh, they're not exactly shrinking violets. No, but I, you know, I think I I heard both John's brothers say, "Well, if that's their decision, we'll we'll accept it and we'll move on. We're not going to kick up a fuss or or you know 
you know, shout that we should be in there. But what I think is more concerning if I was the Samoan Rugby League Samoa is the undercurrent of players who are now talking about between themselves saying we, you know, I th- my personal view is it will end up going the way Tonga did and they'll have to play as an invitational team. Um, I think that's one of two reasons. One is, again, it's the dissatisfaction with Matt Parrish as a coach. I think they'll go get their own coach. And the second one is the dissatisfaction with the board who, again, you know, they haven't felt that that board has been fully transparent and, you know, they need to enforce some kind of change. So in terms of what you're watching this year, you mentioned a couple of blowout scores uh, every week at the moment. Uh, Is that because the good are exceptionally good? And Penrith, for example, have got a generation of players that perhaps don't come along that often. Um, or is there, a, is there a more significant aspect to why some of the teams at the bottom just don't seem to be capable of beating the teams at the top? Uh, I think, you know, there's always been bad administration and someone's always got to finish bottom. Someone's always, always got to recruit bad players. Hello, Lee. Uh, and you've got this situation where the rule changes have been introduced, but they've been introduced at such short notice that teams haven't been able to recruit. And so if you'd gone for a very big pack, as Brisbane did, start of 2019, start of the 2020 season, they had a big pack, they were rolling down the field. The new rule changes came in and guys like Matt Lodge looked lost because they weren't suited to the more dynamic style of play. So I think what the new rules have done is it's widened the chasm even more between the, the the teams who aren't as mobile and teams who are more mo- more mobile. So Penrith are great because they've not actually got that many big blokes. They've got a lot of fit, lean, uh, durable guys. I think that's what's getting them the edge. Um, and you know, teams like Canberra, the last two years have been, you know, got to a grand final, a preliminary final. This year they started really slow. I don't know if it's a fitness thing or whether these new rules have just taken that bit more out of the tank. Um, But what you have got is the scrum still and heartening for us who, for reasons of coronavirus, can't have it. Teams are actually scoring off planned scrum moves. It's taking us back to the 80s. But they've actually reduced the number of scrums because they, when you, I think it's when you kick the ball into touch, you now restart with a play the ball which is one of the great you know, scenes of when you would see at night the steam coming off the scrum. <laughs> and, you know, uh, that would, you know, that would be the reason why the big, that would be the spot where the big lads get their rest. What's not acceptable, by the way, about scrums and the few that they do have still is when they start a prop in, in at first receiver and just let them crash it off, you know, Props should never, that should never happen. They should all, and, and wearing white boots, the two things are banned straight away by running the NRL. Um, but yeah, they did actually trial at the back end of last year that, that rule. But yeah, I think, I think the other thing, the other difference is the teams that move the ball better. And that might sound stupid, but watch how Melbourne played at the back end of last year and they more or less moved in one play. It would go from Monster on one side to Cameron Smith in the middle to Jerome Hughes, and then they attack your centre, and then they'd move back and they'd attack the other centre. And event it was more or less, it was like a shark circling, and eventually they'd strike where they saw a weakness or where someone was tired. Um, send loads of decoys at you. So I think you know it's being smarter in how you attack and move the ball. There's no there's no real five drives and a kick. And I guess for the weaker sides, you can't. The new rules have made it so that you can't get into that arm wrestle and kind of. You can't have five drives and kick to the corner, force an error from a from a tackle, win the ball back and score. So Canterbury were great at that last year. Can't do that now. And they've arguably, arguably we've got better players to do it. So, yeah. Well, we know from watching the uh, NRL coverage that the, uh, the, uh, the vision of uh, the Super League, the European Super League, as it's still called, which is always amusing, um, is, is not uh, always... Uh, as uh, complimentary, perhaps, as we would like it to be, which, but it's probably as uh, accurate as it probably is. Has anyone there read your article about the Bradford Bulls in the 4020 annual a couple of years ago and, and, and realised who might end up running one of their uh, new franchises? 
Yeah, it was, it was funny to see the NRL uh, NRL's own website trumped in a guy who's probably struck off from administering a club in, by his you know, closest sister organisation. But yeah, I mean, uh, I did actually get a tweet yesterday from someone, and curiously, just before we came on air, here's one I made earlier. <laughs> it is. It's got props but, and everything. Yeah, yeah. Um, I've actually got Chalmers. Uh, what they call those dull, dull, no, but um, uh, and I've actually got an odd, odds of Lego kit somewhere down there in the corner, but the yeah, uh, not many people have, but uh, I have sent, I did send that to a few people mainly because of the concern, not, not in the wake of the Chalmers thing when I actually published when we wrote that, so yeah, I'm not sure people are really au fait with um, the the levels of administration in, in the UK and kind of how. You know, kind of ham fisted or or, or error strewn, you know, some of these, you know, things that, or, or kind of, you know, like, I don't think people realize, people don't realize that not every game's televised. And that's, you know, crazy to Australians because they, you, if you don't want to leave the house from Thursday through to Sunday, you don't have to. So I think they find that a bit weird. I think, I think the general tone, the attitude towards Super League is still. Uh, it's a second, you know, it's a reserve grade competition, which I think is unfair. I would always argue that the top four, if you put the top four teams in the Super League in the NRL, you know, historically Leeds, St. Helens, um, Wigan, and, and, and Warrington, and, you know, maybe Hull every now and again, or maybe Catalan this year, they would more, more, more than hold their own. Um, but then that's, you know, a different kettle of fish. I, th- I think the, the the gap is shorter in the NRL, but it is made to look wider. Whereas I think in Super League, it's probably you know you've got the Wigan etc. right at the top, and then then you know the the, the likes of Lee, you know Huddersfield haven't been crash hot the last couple of years. You know, um, Bring but back yeah, the World Club Championship. That's what we need. <laughs> well, <laughs> I don't think that's happening in this current climate, Phil. But I- I'll pass that on. The um... The one thing I was going to ask you, because clearly Rich has quite rightly brought up the idea of a team in New Zealand, um, expansion seems to be on the agenda. Now, it may be expansion out of expediency because clearly um, new markets, new new appeal to next generation of television deals, all that kind of thing. But it's an organisation that in the past hasn't looked beyond its own insular borders. If they are seriously thinking about expansion, what's it going to look like? And we've written some pieces and we've talked a lot about what would be the benefit of them buying a stake in Super League over here and and making expansion a global thing. How likely is that going to happen from anything you've heard over there? Don't th- I don't think that I think the buying a stake in Super League is a complete non-starter because I, I'd ask you this: What are you buying? Uh, you're buying a lot of clubs with, you know, do, are you then buying the ground? Are you buying, you know, the 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 IP? You know, how much is the, um, you know, it, how much is the, is a is a Warrington badge worth? You know, they change theirs every five minutes. But I think expansion-wise, Phil, I think, and I also think, by the way, the NRL doesn't really have any assets of its own, and that was a real criticism during COVID. Was when the AFL, for example, went to remortgage. A couple of stadiums they 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 immediately got cash flow, whereas the NRL couldn't because it didn't own anything. So I think that's going to be a longer term strategy is to invest in bricks and mortar. On expansion, I'd say they click, someone told me who works for a, a sponsorship, you know, sport kind of they they do a recce on how much your sponsorship's worth. He once told me that uh, Brisbane on a Friday night is the most uh, lucrative time time slot apart from when two Melbourne teams play in the AFL. So the NRL is desperate to put a second team in Brisbane. So that's two reasons. One's commercial. And the second one is the AFL spent most of last year because of how intense the COVID lockdown was in Melbourne, in Queensland. So, and they've got two clubs there with Brisbane and the Gold Coast, who they've pumped a lot of money into. And I think they maybe see that they, with the Broncos demise, the Titans haven't been great the last couple of years. There's, moves to be made there, you know, inroads to be made. 
So I think solidifying Brisbane is their first, uh, Queensland is their first priority. That gives you that game every Friday night in Brisbane. Uh, and at some club, it gives you a game every Friday. Um, where to next? <sighs> The, the difficulty is then you'd have 17 teams, right? So you're going to need 18 to even up the draw. My feeling is as good as like a second New Zealand team is, the teams already go and mine all the talent out of there anyway. So that doesn't really add anything. Um, so then your other options are, people will talk about the Central Coast, but I don't think that's much of a goer. The other option would be Perth. The issue with Perth then is you're flying from Auckland when things are back to normal all the way to Perth and WA, which is like seven hour flight. So there's that issue. And then the time zones with Perth are different. So, you know, you're playing, I think that's then like the six hours difference between Perth and uh, Auckland. So that, that's another issue to overcome. So I don't know where they go next. I, my thinking would it would be Perth. Um there's nowhere it really left on the East Coast um, to kind of put a flag in the map, apart from second Brisbane team. Um, someone did say to me the other day that they should put the PNG Hunters in, base them in Cairns, but f- play home games in PNG. Might not be a bad shout. Got to get the oil money out of PNG to, to prop it up, but uh, why not? That's why you were uh, bringing conferences so a team doesn't have to travel from Perth to to Auckland or oh, I hope the, the second Brisbane team does better than the second Wigan team did but uh, call them Brisbane Borough and, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Brisbane Highfield yeah. <laughs> it, it, it's, it, it does seem though that the same problem we have here is the same problem there is that we need to put more focus on the international game but we are so club focused that it's hard to do that and it's hard to change the mindsets of people that to grow the sport, we need to make the international game bigger, but everything else just seems to have so much importance put on it by everyone else. Yeah. And, and, the, and the thing with that is, you know, especially maybe in, um, like, isn't it, like what I'd really like to see is, uh, you know, uh, Valandis is quite a doer and I think he's done a lot of, you know, and I don't agree with every decision he's making, nor, nor should I, you know, I'm not compelled to, but, you know, some of the decisions he, he's made have been good. Um, I would like to think that, you know, they've talked a lot about investing in the country rugby league. I'd like to think, you know, in terms of bush football, I'd like to think the next thing on his agenda is sorting out the international game and, yeah. Hope, hopefully that will be getting a, you know, maybe getting a document and calling it something like framing the future, let's say, where it'll be like a roadmap to, 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 the, to, the, to the future. Um, That'll never, ever catch on. No, no more roadmaps. So, no, yeah. so just, just in terms of Volandis, I know we haven't got long because the satellite's about to go over Lapland and we'll lose you, but um, just in terms of Volandis, is he deemed to be... Um, Morris Lindsay incarnate, or uh, is he a is he a comic figure? Is he, is he widely respected? Um, how, how should I mean? There's envious glances by some people over here cast at him because he's a leader and he's prepared to stand up for the sport. And maybe if that, that's what we're lacking more than anything at the moment, it's that spokesperson. Yeah, I think the the great thing about him is in terms of you know he's always on the front foot. He's always in front of the cameras. You know, he, I think there's, you know, he kind of benevolent dictatorship is the best way I'd describe him. I, could, I don't think I could compare him to, he kind of be like, if, if, you know, there's a bit of Eddie Hearn there, but obviously a different generation. Uh, you know, he talk, you know, talks very well and he's often putting down the AFL or Rugby Union or, or Melbourne type because he hates Melbourne. Um so he's, he's quite quick-witted and, you know, he's quite the, you know, Australian story because he's the guy who is like family of Greek migrants, you know, dad, I don't think his dad spoke much English when he arrived here and he's kind of been, you know, wrote, risen and risen and runs New South Wales Racing and basically runs the NRL, even though he's not called the CEO. You know, you probably don't even know who the CEO is of the NRL at the moment. Mr. Mr. Rabdo. Yeah, there you go. So a South African, weirdly. So, um but yeah, I think the public perception of him is going to be challenged the next couple of months because, as someone said to me, you have leaders for times of uh, for peacetime and leaders for times of war, and he was great during COVID. I'm now 
we're in peacetime and it's like, well, now we're going to see what he's made of. And maybe, you know, ask me in six months' time. We will do. We will do, Josh. We'll get you back on. Uh, thank you for taking the time to uh, speak to us. Uh, what time is it there in Sydney? 10.30. So. Oh, it's not too bad, man, is it? I don't know why I'm, uh, no. I don't know why I'm, why I'm saying thank you. I, I feel like I should do some kind of outro as if I'm Clive James, but uh, I, I don't have the, uh, the skill or the wit to do so. Uh, but it's been a pleasure to speak to you. Thank you very much for taking the time to join us. Um, we'll, we'll look forward to your next missives in 4020 Magazine. Uh, have you got any idea what you're going to write about in the next issue? No, Phil will send me a message about two days before he goes to print and be like, <laughs> very partly, and I'll say, oh, yeah, I forgot about that. Yeah, I'll have you something in 20 minutes. And that usually does the trick. All right. Don't tell people it isn't highly crafted. Oh yeah, oh yeah. But yeah. keep keep writing the long form articles. Not not sorry for us, but you know the the Samoa thing on the back of the Bradford one was. It's just a joy to read stuff like that and the investigative journalism that goes into that. And we 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 haven't talked enough about that because you sort of hinted you started writing the story in February. This isn't something that comes across your desk at nine o'clock and it's it's on the the websites by three so more power to to people like yourself yeah thanks Phil. i i think you know that's a one of the things in the shrinking of the the australian media i find is very news focused very short short term focused whereas like you know i and i feel like in the uk we probably don't have the news coverage so um it's good to be able to craft those things and hone those when you get the chance to you know so anyway, thank you for having me on. That's a pleasure. Um, the good news is, George, yeah. that next time you listen, we we will all be sat around somewhere socially distancing Leeds because we'll we'll be back on Monday. Fingers crossed at six o'clock live. What we feel honest. We're all being well. If I get the Hoover out, you will, <laughs> and, and and the biscuits. Are you coming over for the World Cup? That's the uh, the final question with the time we've got left. Uh, not as it stands, I don't think, because I can't get back into the country because I'm not a citizen or a resident. So if you leave, you're out. You know, it's like kicking out when I'm at, um, you know, at the pub. You know, once you once you go out after the lock-in, you you're done. So yeah, sadly not, I don't think. But maybe they'll make an exception. We're we'll big journalists. Fun. Yeah, fingers crossed. Although just staying in Australia is better. You know, I've seen it on telly. It looks nicer. Yeah, don't get proper fish and chips here, though. Now, move to Brisbane would be my advice. <laughs>